When we consider human colonization of other planets in the solar system, the primary focus is Mars. And that's understandable. It's close enough to the Earth that we could make regular crew and supply trips to it. It has frozen water beneath the surface. We can land on the planet. It has a 24-hour day. Gravity that would be much easier to work in when compared to somewhere like, say, the Moon. Numerous robotic missions on the planet have proven that science equipment and habitats will be able to withstand the Martian temperatures and atmosphere. Though we can't terraform Mars right now due to the lack of sufficient amounts of resources like CO2, we can certainly build habitats and domed colonies there. Mars is the first obvious choice for building a human presence beyond our home world. But why is it that our sister planet Venus is so often overlooked? Can we colonize and possibly even terraform Venus? That's what we're going to explore in today's video. Venus is actually slightly easier for us to send probes to than Mars. It requires less delta V and the launch windows are more frequent. There's also a few other interesting factors to consider. Venus is much closer in size to the Earth than Mars. Venus has a mass that's more than 80% that of the Earth's and with a diameter that's 95% that of the Earth's. So if you were to put them side by side, you'd see that Earth isn't much bigger. Consequently, the surface gravity on Venus is 91% that of the Earth's. So what's the problem with Venus? We've sent probes there in the past. Why does Mars get all the attention? Why aren't we making serious plans to send humans to Venus? Well, while Mars may not exactly be paradise, conditions there are downright benign when you compare them to Venus. Venus is the closest you're going to get in our solar system to a literal hell. Venus is a world shrouded in a thick layer of cloud, several kilometers thick, composed mainly of sulfuric acid. The surface isn't visible from space. There's been over 20 missions to Venus. Only a couple of them have actually landed on the planet. In 1970, the Soviet Venera 7 lander was the first probe to land on another planet. And in 1975, Venera 9 returned the first images from Venus's surface. The probes didn't last too long, functioning for less than an hour on the surface before the corrosive and hostile atmosphere would have rendered them inoperable. Venus has an atmospheric pressure 90 times that of the Earth, which is like being submerged in an ocean on Earth at a distance of about one kilometer. The toxic atmosphere is composed primarily of carbon dioxide. As Venus and Mars both fall short of the Goldilocks zone that Earth inhabits, Venus may very well have had liquid water on its surface millions of years ago. As it stands, it's now a hellish and volcanic world, and thanks to its sulfuric clouds, a global greenhouse effect has taken hold, which helped to produce average surface temperatures of about 462 degrees Celsius. So that's hot enough to melt lead, though not hot enough to melt steel, nickel, or titanium. Therefore, the probes may still be somewhat intact on the surface, though significantly corroded due to the punishing atmosphere. As you might imagine, these conditions don't exactly lend themselves to being a welcoming and enticing prospect for human colonization. But it actually gets worse. Venus rotates so slowly that its day is actually longer than its year. If you wanted to design the most inhospitable world possible, you'd be hard pressed to top Venus. But hypothetically, could it be terraformed? Could we actually radically engineer the environment to become Earth-like? It's practically impossible to do it on Mars, now that we know there's insufficient CO2 there to increase the planet's temperature and atmosphere to make liquid water stable on the surface. By comparison, Venus has an abundance of CO2. But while Mars is far too cold, Venus is far too hot. There are some outlandish terraforming proposals out there for Venus, but they would require even more sophisticated technological solutions than those required for Mars. So to call it a long shot is quite an understatement. But let's run through some things you'd have to do to potentially make it work. The first is reducing the temperature, which is even harder to do than warming a planet. The various processes required to terraform a planet are interconnected. So beginning with removal of the atmosphere would help to begin the process of cooling Venus. In 1994, American astrophysicist James Pollock and Carl Sagan proposed crashing an asteroid 700 kilometers in diameter at 20 kilometers per second into the planet because it could help to eject large amounts of the atmosphere into space. NASA scientist Jeffrey A. Landis calculated that 2,000 such impacts would be required in order to reduce the atmospheric pressure to that of the Earth. This is a well-documented proposal, but I'll include links in the description box to some sources for further reading. Given the literally astronomical variables involved here, the success of this outlandish plan requires unimaginable levels of coordination and precision 
at a level of technological capability well beyond where we are today. This is 24th century Star Trek fantasy at this point. Once the atmosphere is reduced, the next process would be the introduction of hydrogen in order to facilitate the production of organic compounds to help convert the CO2 into oxygen. But the biggest challenge, of course, remains the temperature. Venus may very well have succumbed to the greenhouse effect due to its proximity to the sun. The planet receives twice as much sunlight as Earth, and if we're going to try to achieve and sustain Earth-like temperatures on Venus, that would require yet more futuristic science fiction levels of engineering. One such far-fetched idea is to construct either a series of giant mirrors in space to reflect much of the sunlight, or a massive solar shade that would be placed at some point in between the Sun and Venus. Obviously, the diameter of the shade depends on its distance from Venus. What futuristic and super durable material will be needed to construct such an object is still very much open to debate. Needless to say, this shade would require resources and materials sourced and mined from elsewhere in the solar system in what would be the largest and most elaborate thing human beings would ever have constructed. The goal is not to blot out the sun entirely, but partially. Not only would this reduce the solar wind issue, but also serve as a makeshift replacement for a magnetic shield. There's one final major hurdle in making Venus more like Earth, and that's its rotation. As I said, Venus rotates far too slowly. While an Earth day is 24 hours, a day on Venus is 5,832 hours, about 243 Earth days. This is not exactly ideal for animal and plant life. So to deal with this, Venus's rotation would be increased by yet more technologically innovative solutions that are far beyond our capabilities at present. One possibility would be to somehow fling one of Jupiter's moons, or indeed the planet Mercury, in the direction of Venus in a close flyby and then bringing it in line as a new moon of Venus. Venus doesn't currently have a moon, so I guess that would be nice. This could accelerate its rotation, but again, the efficacy of this plan is contingent on a series of astronomical factors and variables that are difficult to accurately predict. Aside from the fact that we don't currently have the technology to move moons and planets around the solar system like shooting balls around on a pool table, as to whether we'd be able to bring Venus to something close to 24 hours in day-night rotation is anyone's guess. Terraforming Venus is completely impractical, but it is hypothetically possible if you believe in magic-like technological capabilities we're not even close to inventing yet. As for colonizing Venus in its current state, in some kind of habitats, living on the surface in any capacity is out of the question, obviously, but apparently we could live in the clouds. Yes, another pie-in-the-sky idea. This one, quite literally. NASA's Jeffrey A. Landis produced a paper on this in 2003, and he says, Although the surface of Venus is an extremely hostile environment, at about 50 kilometers above the surface, the atmosphere of Venus is the most Earth-like environment, other than the Earth itself, in the solar system. It is proposed here that in the near term, human exploration of Venus could take place from aerostat vehicles in the atmosphere, and in the long term, permanent settlements could be made in the form of cities designed to float at about 50 km altitude in the atmosphere of Venus. At an altitude slightly above 50 km above the surface, the atmospheric pressure is equal to the Earth's surface atmospheric pressure of one bar. At this level, the environment of Venus is benign. Above the clouds, there is abundant solar energy. Temperature is in the habitable liquid water range of between 0 to 50 degrees Celsius. Atmosphere contains the primary volatiles required for life, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. Gravity is 90% of the gravity at the surface of Earth. While the atmosphere contains droplets of sulfur acid, technology to avoid acid corrosion are well known and have been used by chemists for centuries. In short, the atmosphere of Venus is most Earth-like environment in the solar system. Although humans cannot breathe the atmosphere, pressure vessels are not required to maintain one atmosphere of habitat pressure. In other words, you won't need pressurized spacesuits. Kind of reminds me of that Star Trek, the original series episode, The Cloud Minders, with the city that floats in the sky. Anyway, guys, that about does it for this video. Thanks very much for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.